James Cameron's latest film, which was 13 years in the making, Avatar, The Way of Water, is a sequel to the number one grossing film of all time. And it continues Cameron's lifelong attack on the one true God and continues to push mystical religions and New Age thought. As we look at his own admission of using these movies as a Trojan horse to push his beliefs. Stay with us as we look at these and other stories on the 511 News. Welcome back to the 511 News. I'm your host, Chad Davidson of Good Fight Ministries. And on today's episode, we're going to be looking at the brand new Avatar film, Avatar, The Way of Water. And we're going to be discussing some of James Cameron's beliefs and the fact that he has truly made it his lifelong mission to come against the one true God and push people to other false mystical religions. Before we do, make sure you click on the like button. That gets this episode up so more people can hear the truth about what's going on. And make sure you subscribe to our Good Fight Ministries YouTube page. And also, if you get a chance, make sure to go to the podcast if that's the way you listen to this. And make sure you give us a five-star review if you can. I say all that because that helps more and more people to hear the message of truth as we are warning people about these very films that so many people are flocking to when it comes to James Cameron and his movies, two of the top three movies in terms of gross money put towards by the viewer actually are movies by James Cameron. While plenty of people know him from the sci-fi thriller of Aliens or Terminator 2, Judgment Day or Terminator 1 as well, um, the, the fact is that James Cameron, alongside Titanic and other movies, has seemingly made a lot of films that are very popular with a lot of people. And a lot of people don't really know where his worldview truly is and what he's pushing across. And a lot of people don't know what's going on in the recent Avatar film, which uh, actually took 13 years after making the original one. And when it comes to this, I want you to see the effect that some people might believe that Avatar could have on other people. In fact, James Cameron himself really wants multiple films and has already filmed not only one and two and three, but also parts of four before those two are even released because he believes that one of the missing aspects of Avatar being a cult classic like Star Wars and otherwise is the fact that there aren't these number of films alongside of it. So now that is what is coming out in terms of Avatar. And so I want you guys to hear Marianne Williamson, who actually ran for president and was quite mocked for some of her very strange beliefs, but is a new ager, I guess as much as the term could possibly be stretched, a new ager to the fullest. And Marianne Williamson, who is not only multiple times a New York Times best-selling author, but she also ran for president and Rob Bell, of course, the guru himself, Rob Bell, as you can see in our film, The Submerging Church, Rob Bell actually quoted her, but said that the quote was from Nelson Mandela, but we found out very clearly that this was in Marianne Williamson, New Age mumbo gumbo. But nonetheless, this was her views on Avatar and how important it was for America to really understand this film. I was um, pretty universally mocked and uh, uh, teased uh, during my presidential campaign for tweets that I had written uh, back when the Avatar movie first came out in 2009. I said that I thought that if Western civilization survives, it will be because enough people have seen and understood the Avatar movies. I said that if you really wanted to understand what's going on in America today, you would watch the Avatar movie because uh, it gives you the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And um, actually, it's interesting because in preparing for my interview, uh, watching it several more times, if anything, I'm even more enthused and even more convinced of the fundamental and powerful and relevant truth-telling of Avatar. So obviously, if we need as a culture for things to change, we have to understand Avatar. So what is this film about? If you haven't ever seen Avatar, 
whether the first one or the second one. Let me give a few of the plot points to give you an idea of really what the film is about. On the lush alien world of Pandora live the Navi, beings who appear primitive but are highly evolved. Because the planet's environment is poisonous, human Navi hybrids called avatars must link to human minds to allow for free movement on Pandora. Jake Sully, played by Sam Worthington, a paralyzed former Marine, becomes mobile again through one such avatar and falls in love with a Navi woman, played by Zoe Saldana. As a bond with her grows, he is drawn into a battle for the survival of her world. Now, most people could hear that plot and say, wow, this sounds eerily similar to Dances with Wolves or Pocahontas or Fern Gully. In fact, if you actually look at some of the images from Fern Gully next to some of the images that were in Pandora, it looks like James Cameron might have been peeking over the side. But nonetheless, it's one of those things you go, okay, this is very simplistic. But the fact that the film did so well has to do with the reality that James Cameron is masterful at CGI and masterful and way ahead of his time when it comes to a lot of his filmmaking. And here comes number two. This is Avatar, The Way of Water. Jake Sully and Natiri have formed a family and are doing everything to stay together. However, they must leave their home and explore the regions of Pandora. When an ancient threat resurfaces, Jake must fight a difficult war against the humans. Now, when it comes to the plot line here, if we kind of put both of these together, Jake, once again, as a human, goes into this realm and now as an avatar becomes a leader ultimately. And you have that struggle going on where they find out he's really one of the very contentious uh, humans that are coming to grab the minerals away from these characters. And I'm sure for most people, if they're watching it, they're going to look at now the first avatar and see a clear correlation between not taking down the rainforest or taking uh, indigenous people, their land and so forth here in America. And that's an easy parallel to draw. And then the second one has to do more with the water life. And so James Cameron is putting some of his viewpoints into these things to make sure, hey, I love nature and we want to stop the deforestation and what has happened to the indigenous people. And that's what we see. But there are also these religious motifs that continue to happen throughout the film, whether it's clear paganism that he's excited to showcase in the films or when you hear certain things like the main doctor, the one of the main characters played by Sigourney Weaver. And that doctor is none other than Dr. Grace Augustine. Now, that's kind of an interesting name. I'm sure you might see the religious connotation that it seems to be grabbing from there. But one of the most climactic scenes in the film is when Grace Augustine is actually injured and she actually is trying to be saved by becoming a Navi and doing so by connecting with Awa. And that climactic scene has us see this take place. And this will link us with a very important detail with the second film. And this is from a, an article on Game Rant. It says, Dr. Augustine's last words were, quote, I see her. The implication appeared to be that she had finally come to accept the existence of Awa and may have communed with the Navi's patron goddess. Now, a couple of things there. You hear that terminology, Awa, and really that's Yahweh backwards, which is already a very interesting dynamic. Uh, it speaks to this feminine nature. And one of the things that James Cameron brings out in a number of his interviews and so forth is the idea of the indigenous people that they actually didn't see a difference between themselves and nature, but they are more a part of nature, which would actually fall in line, even as even though most people would say he's an atheist, would fall in line with what some people might call Espinoza's God, or even some forms of pantheism, or even panentheism. And it's really interesting to kind of see that come to light. And then also them using this premise of Awa. And you have Grace Augustine converting almost in a deathbed conversion because supposedly she dies, even though there's going to be a wrinkle in part two and probably part three and four regarding this. 
Supposedly she dies, but Sigourney Weaver is now back and she actually plays the daughter of Grace Augustine and Jake and Kiri adopt her. But it's a really interesting dynamic that most people are pointing out that it looks like there might be an immaculate conception here. It looks like, and this isn't hundred percent, but a lot of people are pointing this out because there is this underlining factor going on the entire time where, where is this young girl's father? We know who her mother is, was Grace Augustine, but who is this young girl's actual father? And a lot of people are saying, well, it looks like maybe she was immaculately conceived which would make a lot of sense with a lot of the parallels that they draw. And I don't want you to just take this for my opinion, like that this is what they're doing, that they're drawing all these parallels from these indigenous, you know, uh, religions, from Christianity and so forth. But that actually seems to be exactly what they're doing. And I want you to hear in terms of Avatar, what the primary goal, according to James Cameron, uh, actually is when it comes to Avatar. In terms of Avatar... I think that the greatest level of sophistication is when you can bring very sophisticated information into simple form. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes Avatar, that you could tell that level of sophisticated truth in almost like a cartoon, yeah, which yeah. is what re religion and spirituality is. And there are religious and spiritual themes right. throughout. Uh, throughout. When and they're there, and they're there by design. They're not accidental. I mean, the film I think was dismissed by some critics as being too simplistic, too familiar a story, just a sort of Pocahontas story, and so on. And I don't think they they realized that it was by design a kind of Trojan horse to allow you to deal with a very familiar and simple plot line that has these other layers and textures to it which was my focus. You know, my focus was on the design, the fabric of the world, the feeling evoked by the watching, you know, so you can synthesize the plot quite, or sum up the plot quite quickly, but you can't sum up the experience quickly. And so it was experiential filmmaking. That was the, that was the primary goal. Something else you might notice is this pushing along of mystery religions and witch doctors. And this is something that is so common in film so often when it comes to trying to find wisdom and so forth. Let's just find some mystical ancient religion and they'll be the one that ultimately has the answer when the answer truly is found in what the Bible teaches. Because the most ancient religion is the one that goes back to Yahweh. It's the one that goes back to Adam and Eve. It's the one that goes back to the very personhood right there of Adam and Eve the, the serpent in the garden, we see in the scriptures, and we have a resurrected king, not made up resurrections like we have in Avatar, not like reincarnations or what looks to be almost a version of this AI uh, living on past because you put the consciousness or thoughts and ideas inside of a computer. So now the kernel from the previous one can now be in this one and so forth. And it's no, over and over again, we see the true resurrection that happens in Jesus Christ and the promise of our resurrection to come is stamped with the truth of Jesus's resurrection that already took place before over 500 witnesses. So we have eyewitness testimony and not just storylines and mythology, but a true historical act that took place. And yet you have people stealing these ideas, hoping for some other way of eternity and pushing new age thought, and it's just mystical and nonsense. And a lot of times when we look at some of the new age thought and some of the things that are pushed over and over again from all these different, whatever you want to call them, you whether it is indigenous religions, whether Hinduism or Buddhism or whatever, over and over again, you see this nonsense and it's never grounded in any truth. And it has so much ridiculousness when you actually understand it. And I want you to hear from James Cameron as he goes on further to explain of what he wanted to showcase regarding religions prior to Christianity. So it's almost like the, all the Christian mythology is there, the Buddhist, the Buddhist principles are there, then you come up with the Egyptian mythology. So I don't know, I mean, I know that you, you could not have done this without a conscious understanding of many of these principles, but in terms of the ecumenicism of it and yeah, the universality yeah. of these principles, I, I thought was amazing. Well, I do think, you know, certainly you've got, you know, certain kind of Messiah myths that, prop, that go through and 
and you know yes. Osiris death and re redemption and, and resurrection and all that sort of thing and but I, I think I was consciously refer referencing the sort of pre-Christian pagan mystery religions that are more goddess based and more kind of holistic and nature worshiping uh, and and less sort of patriarchal than that that which came subsequently. And what's interesting is when you go on different atheist websites, they have, oh, let's push the fact that the best director, James Cameron, he's also an atheist. He's one of us. But it's really interesting because what he wants to do is mesh science and religion together to get really new age spirit science, which is ultimately where I believe in the end times, a lot of these atheists are going to push towards it seems to me, and I'm sure that you agree, I mean, obviously you made Avatar, it's not just our disconnection from science, it's also our disconnection from the spirituality of, of the indigenous peoples. Yes, exactly. I mean, isn't the yeah. marriage of those two things what you present to the world Absolutely. so profoundly in this movie? I guess I'm saying that we've lost our connection to nature. You know, the beauty of the, the indigenous worldview, and of course, you can't make gross generalizations about all these different uh, indigenous cultures, but a few generalizations do apply. And one of them is they tend not to see nature as separate from themselves. Uh, and mm -hmm. in some cases, they don't even have a word in their language for nature in the sense that we do, that nature is something else, somewhere else or mm -hmm. something that you go visit. But they, they don't have a word for nature the way we have a word for nature. Oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go be in nature as opposed to an urban environment, a non-nature non-natural environment. They don't even have that concept for the most part. So they see themselves as playing a role in a big, rich tapestry of life, and they're part of the natural cycles and, and so on. And what's interesting is the effect that James Cameron has even had on some of the very actors that have worked on the film. In fact, the stunt double of the main character, Jake Soley, was Reuben Langdon. And I want you to hear him describe what James Cameron thought the film would actually be. He said, Jim, you know, uh, hats off. This was after, right after the release of Avatar. I said, I think Avatar has shifted the consciousness of the planet, mm -hmm. you know, or it's in the process of shifting it. Uh, and he goes, no, no, I don't see it that way. He says, I think um, the consciousness of the planet was ready to receive Avatar. Mm -hmm. uh, and that if it had come out any earlier, uh, it probably would have tanked at the box office. And, and I really thought about that and I've, i still think about it today thinking yeah it's 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 really a like a double-edged sword or the chicken before the egg it, it's really is that that kind of well the audience has to be ready for it it has it will also yes shift the the, the consciousness but the consciousness has to be ready to receive it for it to have any type of of, of proper yeah. effect it's always interesting to me to see the arrogance in people when it comes to how they think of their own, I guess, their own work and how they're going to change things. And I do believe he can change things and people's worldview gets changed because they continue to meditate and sit at the seat of scoffers of people that hate Jesus. But it's really interesting to hear how this man's life, Reuben Langdon, how much he has changed ever since the film. And I want you to hear this clip because it's really interesting some of the things he brings out. Right around that time is when YouTube started coming out. And this was before they started censoring everything. Zeitgeist and Stephen Greer's Disclosure Project. And, oh, yeah. Um, Loose Change and all these, these documentary films that I had never heard of uh, were released on YouTube. So we had access to this stuff. And uh, myself and the team of actors in the back, our minds were getting blown. Like we yeah. were watching this stuff, just like, oh, what? No way! That can't the towers. Who? Oh my God! Yeah. Um, so it was really uh, sort of red pilling us. Simultaneously, we're working on a film that has to do. You know, our homework as actors is we. I had to learn about indigenous cultures. Mm -hmm. I had to learn uh, physically. You know how they dressed and everything. A lot of Cameron had. Um, on set uh, posted all over the stage, um, all these different pictures from different indigenous uh, oh, wow. around the world. And he encouraged us to look at all these different indigenous cultures and implement you know, their ideas, their teachings and their uh, belief systems and, and 
as much as we could as performers so we could then yeah come out into the performance because that's you know that's how we're performing we're, right we're this navi this indigenous race of of um blue yeah bean. jim was a stickler for for detail so, yeah uh so i'm learning i learned about ayahuasca i learned about indigenous teachings in general and the belief systems and all this stuff was happening simultaneously as we're getting red pilled behind the scenes notice a couple of things he talked about being red pilled he talked about ayahuasca and what's interesting is in the first film there is a deleted scene that without a doubt looks like somebody going on an ayahuasca trip what was i think super cool in my experience is i had been seeking out ayahuasca uh i had been i learned about it on the set of avatar you know jim there was a there's a deleted scene if anybody wants to look look up on avatar i think you can see it on the internet it's not a fully rendered so somehow it got released and we uh i remember being in the ceremony he eats this this psychedelic worm is is administered to him in the ceremony but i was one of the members in the ceremony helping to facilitate and jim's explaining the scene he's like okay this scene it's based off this plant medicine in the jungle of the amazon called ayahuasca and it's a psychedelic thing and what is this good so i'm learning that's the first time i learned about ayahuasca wow so my curiosity was weaponized then about ayahuasca and the more research i started doing into the et realms uh and getting red pilled you know following that thread uh it kept leading me back to a spiritual thread and then into indigenous teachings and into plant medicines which were used to do different uh, uh, things and take people on this this spiritual journey this is the stuff being propagated over and over and over again think about the number one podcast right now is joe rogan what does he push ayahuasca he could have guys like Aaron Rodgers on and Aaron Rodgers could go and do ayahuasca and brag about it. Now it's a household joke with people who watch football about ayahuasca and listen to the way that Aaron Rodgers describes his ayahuasca trip, because I find it really interesting. And when I say interesting, I think demonic, actually. It was a magical, magical uh, first night um, of just surrendering to any of the lessons uh, that needed to come through, through the grandmother spirit of the vine. And it was a very deep and meaningful uh, couple nights uh, ceremony. And I came back and knew that I was never going to be the same. Um, and like you said, it, it doesn't, you don't do that. And then not, uh, for me, I didn't do that and think, oh, I'm never playing football again. No, it, it gave me a deep and meaningful uh, appreciation for life. And my intention the first night going in was I want to feel what pure love feels like that was my intention and I did mm. I really did I had a magical experience with uh, the sensation of feeling a hundred different hands on my body imparting a blessing of love and forgiveness for myself and gratitude for this life from what seemed to be my ancestors. And now notice Ruben Langdon, all of these guys, and they're talking about James Cameron, ayahuasca. He's deleting scenes where ayahuasca's in it. And then I look at it and I see that this guy, Ruben Langdon, has now switched his entire life's goal to proving that aliens are real. Ultimately, whether ayahuasca or otherwise, you have something demonic afoot. And guess what? One of the first things he mentions was how on YouTube, they weren't really regulating things in the very beginning. And so he watched a film called Zeitgeist. And this is one of those things that I find really interesting because Zeitgeist for most people was a truther video. And a lot of people were pointing to the fact that it's talking about 9-11 and the Twin Towers, as Ruben Langdon mentioned in that interview and in him getting red pilled. But one of the things that Zeitgeist did was showcase that Jesus Christ never really existed. And he was just a copycat of all these other religions. Now I can tell you first and foremost, that is one of the dumbest things that I have ever had to research and actually see where the source material is coming from and who is saying it. And Zeitgeist, the film might have been the worst sourced film I have ever watched. And the premise behind it is one of the silliest things I have ever, ever come in contact with and yet, you have people like Bill Maher and others espousing it. The only thing worse that I have found, period, 
is Richard Pellegrino's book regarding Jesus basically being a fertility god and basically being a mushroom. But don't let me get into that because Joe Rogan keeps espousing this nonsense as well. But when it comes to mythology, when it comes to people like James Cameron or Joe Rogan or anyone who, when they actually go away from the truth, it's interesting because Jesus is, according to John 1, 1, the Logos. That, that's where we get the term logic from. And when you throw out the one true God, the one you've been made in his image, it is so interesting how you will trade that one true God for anything, the indigenous, whatever it may be. And when it comes to James Cameron, that's exactly what he's done. In fact, James Cameron has been a part of two films that what he wanted to do, just like Zayat Geist with its terrible information that was just silly, what he wanted to do was debunk first the book of Exodus and then that Jesus Christ rose again on the third day. I'll just read a couple of reviews because I really want to deal with more of the Jesus film that he worked on. But in terms of Exodus Decoded, the New York Times even placed it in a conspiracy theory documentary. And the Jerusalem Post noted that none of the arguments made in the film were accepted by any mainstream archaeology and that the filmmaker, J Jacob Avicii, I have no idea how to say that. I have no idea what you're saying. Freely admitted his lack of academic credentials. But that was not the only film that he would work on with Jacob Avicii or Bavici. Uh, Simcha Jacob Avicii. That's the best I can do. I'm going to let him have this one. In the pseudo-archaeological docudrama that he did titled The Lost Tomb of Jesus, where he tried to prove that he could find the tomb of Jesus. And I'm, I want to get into some of that, but we're, we're really running low on time here. So I'll just make a few points and then I'll let the scholars talk about it in the way they should, because this was just a ridiculous piece of, I would just say garbage. And what's interesting is that they had a book that was accompanied with the film. And the book was by a man by the name, which I, th I found very interesting, of Charles Pellegrino. And Charles Pellegrino has had his books withdrawn from publishers because of false claims that he even had a PhD and errors that have been found in the books that he has written. And so him and Jacob Avicii, who's also been discredited, both of them were involved in the lost tomb of Jesus. And I want to read from a few of the reviews so you can get it, and not just hear me saying why I think it's a ridiculous film. So let me read from some of them. This is Josias, an archaeologist. He said, Simchi has no credibility whatsoever. He's pimping off the Bible. He got this guy Cameron who made Titanic or something like that. What does this guy know about archaeology? I'm an archaeologist, but if I were to write a book about brain surgery, you would say, who is this guy? People want signs and wonders. Projects like these make a mockery of the archaeological profession. Stephen Fan also thinks the inscription read as Jesus in the film has been misread and suggests that the name Hanun might be a more accurate rendering. The Washington Post reports that William G. Dever has been working as an archaeologist in Israel for over 50 years and said this, I've known about these ossuaries for many years, and so have many other archaeologists. And none of us thought that it was much of a story, because these are rather common Jewish names from that period. It's a publicity stunt, and it will make these guys very rich. And it will upset millions of innocent people, because they don't know enough to separate fact from fiction. Ben Witherington said this, So as far as we can tell, the earliest followers of Jesus never called Jesus son of Joseph, which is written on the tomb, by the way. It was outsiders who mistakenly called him that. Now, just so you know, they did get some of their information from Gnostic texts written, oh, three centuries, four centuries after the time of Jesus. You know, they'd hate to actually pay attention to what those writers from the first century who walked with Jesus had to say. But this all goes to say the very thing that I want to say. And that is that when you turn aside the truth, when you turn away from what is true, you will typically go and run after just about any falsity. The Bible describes it in Romans 1 as suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. Ultimately, he can find so much quality under these 
non-patriarchal religions, uh, as he talks about in the interview with Marianne Williamson. But ultimately, James Cameron, every single one of us are going to face God on the day of judgment. And we better be right with him. Prepare to meet your maker. Because every one of us, we have an end to this life. You can't put your conscience inside of a computer and live on forever. You can't attach yourself to nature. But the truth is, the one who made it all, this is his footstool. And Jesus Christ, in love, came to die a horrible death on the cross so that you and I could have our sins paid for. Or we also have the choice to pay for those sins for all eternity and neglect so great a salvation that has been offered to us. I encourage you all not to get caught up in these new age mumbo gumbo nonsense, not being entertained by the very people that are trying to disprove the God who died for you. Yes, Jesus Christ is God. It says he purchased the church with his own blood in Acts 20, 28. Don't turn away and turn him aside so you can spend three hours and 15 minutes or whatever this terrible film is so that you can enjoy new age thought being jammed down your throat like a Trojan horse. Turn over to Jesus, go read your Bible, and put your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, the one who paid for your sins on Calvary's cross. This has been Chad Davidson. It's the 511 News. Thank you guys so much for watching 511 News. You can check out some of the older episodes as well as the Good Fight radio show and videos we have right here on our YouTube channel. God bless you guys.